I am obliged, under the rules of engagement, to indulge in a brief exposition of our theme today and to connect it, hopefully, in some way to James Finton uh, Lawler. Uh, I will be basing this exposition on his writings, not on psychoanalyzing his motives, as uh, Ruth suggested might have been an interesting possibility. It would have been uh, very, very interesting, except the little drama last night was based on the words of James Finton Lawler. He didn't, unfortunately, write much about his Eden complex, so um, Mike Finn was not able to use uh, that kind of material to really allow me to nail him on the fact that you're doing all this because you hate your father and you want to kill him, and so on and so forth. Um, let me begin with the iconic phrase, Ireland her own, and all therein, from the sod to the sky, the soil of Ireland for the people of Ireland. A distillation in two lines of the philosophy of James Finton Lawler. Pithy, pointed, simple, and precise. But one of the questions I would ask, is this the sort of man we would want around the place today? Or to borrow one of those most elegant phrases, modern phrases, is this the kind of man we would want around the place going forward? What would he think of the Ireland of today, no longer her own, to use his own words, but dependent on the highly qualified generosity of the EU, the ECB, and the IMF. As an early advocate of rent strikes, he's clearly a champion of the principle of strategic default. So we can be pretty sure where he would have stood on the issue of repaying speculators from the National Exchequer and borrowing billions to repay bets that went badly wrong. Uh, Lawler is someone who didn't shirk on popularity and who stuck to his guns, literally, in that he was also an advocate of armed rebellion. He loathed temporising and compromise, so I think he would have been ill at ease in 21st century politics. He was also a contrarian, let's be honest about it, let's face it, and revelled in, in that, but I, I promise not to psychoanalyse, so I won't take that one any further. This is a man who detested the milk and water forelock-tugging nature of the repeal movement of Daniel O'Connell and made no bones about his opposition to what he saw as a half measure of national independence. He was even prepared to sup with the enemy in the form of the Tory Prime Minister Robert Peel uh, rather than countenance the advance of what he saw as an insipid agitation, uh, such an insipid agitation as the repeal movement. So would there have been any room in the Ireland of today or for, uh, of tomorrow for such a man? unlikely in a political system that doesn't appear to be able to see beyond party discipline. Lawler was, among other things, what used to be called, uh, uh, when I started uh, in, in, in university, a political economist. Now they're just economists. Allow me to introduce a, a concept from another branch of the dismal science, behavioural economics, and that is the so-called say-do gap. Very simple. People say one thing, and then do something entirely different. Today's politicians, and more than likely, I would hazard a guess, those of the future, leave a lot of clear ground between the say and the do. It's a gap as wide as the Connor Pass. Lawler, while not, let's face it, entirely consistent himself, is rather like Horton the Elephant in the Dr. Seuss story, who meant what he said and said what he meant. While we, the people, might actually like that sort of person, there's no real place for them in our polity, I think, except on the fringes. Um, and uh, now come the buts and the howevers. However, one element of Lawler's writings which render him very modern indeed is his employment of that essential weapon in every political armory, ambiguity. Let me reintroduce you to the phrase, the soil of Ireland for the people of Ireland. That was a precursor, and has been pointed out on many occasions, the precursor of the Land League slogan, the land for the people, and I would contend is just as ambiguous. What does it mean? The soil of Ireland for the people of Ireland. On the face of it, it suggests an element of collectivisation forced on, for example, Russian peasants by the communist governments of the 1920s and the 1930s. A radical proposal indeed, if taken at face value. Some people would have traced an influence 
to the writings of the US economist and political thinker, <clears throat> a man called Henry George. There's no real evidence uh, to link uh, their thinking. George was an advocate of land nationalisation in works like Progress and Poverty. And through an intermediary, Patrick Ford, who was the editor of an Irish-American newspaper, The Irish World, Michael Davitt was introduced to Henry George and was influenced by the thinking of George. And what does he do? He comes out in favour of land nationalisation. And from that point onwards, the father of the Land League becomes a bad smell. He becomes an embarrassment to his erstwhile acolytes and colleagues. Uh, he becomes an embarrassment to the leadership of the Irish National League, to Charles Stuart Parnell. They still pay lip service to him as a sort of a pilgrim father of agrarian reform, but nobody wanted to hear about land nationalisation. Um, because whatever John James Simpson Lauder might have meant with his notion of the soil of Ireland for the people of Ireland, the Land League phrase, the land for the people, was as banal as keeping current tenants on their current holdings. It was only redistributive in the sense that, on occasions, it afforded, and to some extent was meant to afford, some of the bigger farmers an opportunity to increase the size of their holdings, to become ranchers and make further inroads into the agricultural labouring classes, a class who, as uh, Ruth Dudley Edwards pointed out in the last session, uh, James Finton Lawler largely ignored, as in fairness, pretty much did the Land League and people like Star Charles Stuart Parnell. Et voila, happy days. Banish, on the one hand, the overbearing landlord and the potentially dangerous underclass with one trite slogan, the land for the people. If, um, if anyone is beginning to get a sense of deja vu, I think that's not altogether surprising. Burn the bondholders, the ultimate expression of the say-do gap. The land for the people is a fine slogan, as long as any such transactions are, are mediated by bankers and developers so that both sides benefit at the expense of the poor sod in the middle. So maybe we should amend the, the famous phrase of James Finton Lawler and should become from the poor sod to the sky. Um, OK, we're here to talk about a vision for Ireland. And uh, Lawler had a vision for Ireland, what, what one, which led to him being cited as an influence and a guru by figures as diverse as John O'Leary, Patrick Pearce, and James Connolly. So we're back to ambiguity, uh, I think, in, in, in this instance. I am the possessor, uh, the proud possessor, of a cloth bag purchased in San Francisco. It bears the legend, what would Al Gore do? W-W-A-G-D. The idea being that in some way, the former American vice president has a monopoly on political, economic, and environmental infallibility. Now, of course, he doesn't. Nobody does. Neither did James Finton Lawler. But perhaps in considering the idea of a vision for Ireland, we can ask the question, what would James Finton Lawler do? Would he abolish the Senate? Or would he consider this to be a petty parish question? much as he did the mere repeal of the Act of Union? Would he want a root and branch reform of dull procedures and the dominance of the executive to be checked? Would he want to see the banks reprivatized? Or would he prefer, given their dismal record of public service, that they remain within the ambit of the state and be forced on occasion to act in the public interest as the public would remain the principal shareholder? Would he want to see the country retain or even improve its current level of income redistribution? Or would he be an advocate um, of the, the low taxation regimes preferred elsewhere and preferred by some of our own political parties in the past? Um, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, that was the famous dictum of Lawler's contemporary Karl Marx. Would James Finton Lawler agree with that? Or would he advocate the more Darwinian but actually quite ancient notion that to the victor go the spoils? Would he champion greater levels of local and regional autonomy in this country, a return to genuine local democracy? Or would he be in favour of the current or perhaps even at an increased level of centralisation and consolidation in what is, after all, a country with a much, much smaller population than would have been the case when he was a writer and campaigner? What would James Finton Lawler do? We don't know. He's left us his writings as some kind of a guide, but these are open to and have been exposed to a variety of interpretations. And perhaps like a number of those who have quoted and or appropriated Lawler, we might simply pick and choose 
from amongst his writings, or God forbid, we might actually twist that writing to our own ends in a self-serving, self-special uh, pleading interpretation. I have no idea what road our panellists are going to go down, whether they will ask what would James Finton Lawler do, whether they will address some or any of the issues that I've just raised in terms of a vision for Ireland. But uh, let's find out um, what, what they are going to say.